Well, we want to do a, uh, a brief closing to our teaching on the kingdom of God. So uh, let's look at uh, two verses in the book of Revelation. And we'll compare Revelation 10, 7 to Revelation eleven fifteen. 10, 7 and eleven fifteen. 10, 7 says, Ulam biyame kol hamalach ha-shvi'i ba'amdo litkoa ba-shofa gam yushlam raz elohim kmo shebisela avadav ha-nevi'im. It says, however, in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the voice of the, seventh, of the seventh angel, sorry, when he stands to sound his trumpet, at that time also the mystery of God will be completed or fulfilled just as was uh, uh, preached, by, declared by his servants and prophets. So what we see is that the kingdom of God is a mystery that has stages, gets revealed to us little by little until we come to the end of it. Now, we haven't reached the seventh angel and the seventh trumpet yet, which means we all have more to learn about what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is still being unfolded to us by definition, unless somebody already got past what the seventh angel was. But uh, So we want to understand the mystery of the kingdom of God and how it's developing and where we are in that stage until we get to the seventh angel. So let's look what the seventh angel has to say in uh, chapter 11, verse 15. המלאך השביעי תקע בשופר וקולות גדולים נשמעו בשמיים אומרים הייתה ממלכת תבל ממלכתו של אדוננו ושל משיחו והוא אם לא אוכלי עולם ועד and it says and when the seventh angel sounded uh, his trumpet his shofar great voices were heard in the heavens saying the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Huh? <laughs> so let's, um, let's just try to review a few principles about the kingdom of God. In the previous class, we said that the, uh, the greatest prayer, priority of the kingdom is and says, and may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which is also the simplest definition of what is the kingdom of God. Amen. The kingdom of God is when the will of God is done on earth as it is in heaven. The change is primarily in the will of men. We said it has cooperation between heaven and earth, it has direction from heaven to earth, and it has initiative from earth to heaven. Amen. So I like something my sister shared with me in the break. She said that, that uh, even if men want to bring the kingdom, we can't do it without God, and God can do it without men, but he won't do it without men. So God wants to make, God refuses to bring his kingdom without men, and we can't do it without him. So, um, so here the kingdom of God uh, progresses all the way until the seventh angel, which is shortly before the second coming of Yeshua. It's not the last trumpet. That comes later. The seventh, this is the seventh of that series of the angels. And then after there comes a final trumpet when Yeshua returns. But there is a mystery that's unfolding. What's a mystery? That's a God thought that you don't know that he does know. Amen. What's a revelation? It's when that God thought that he knows, you find out about it. Amen. So you have it. That's when you find out one of God's thoughts. Then it, before, before you knew it, it's a mystery. When you knew it, it's a revelation. And when you understand it, then it becomes wisdom. So things start as a mystery, become a revelation, and then wisdom. It's all just a thought of God. Poor God doesn't have any mysteries because he knows everything. So it's a mystery to us. He knows it. We get one of his thoughts. It's a revelation. And then when we understand it, we have wisdom. And so here it says the, the kingdom of God is being unfolded to us in stages that will come to the last part of the plan, which is at the very end, 
And what's the last part of the plan? But he already told us, so we can look. <laughs> he says, all the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. I mean, ultimately, the kingdom of God does take over this planet and takes over everything in this planet. That's where we will get to at the end. It doesn't start there. It's where we get to at the end. My brother Roni here shared a very sweet teaching last week, which I'll steal from him right now. He gets the credit. But he said the kingdom of God comes in five stages. First of all, it's in your heart. Where's the kingdom of God? Luke 17, in your heart. By the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, it's in your heart. And then it spreads into the church, the kihila, the ecclesia, into a group of people, not just you. She said, when you have faith in your heart, then I will build my kihila, I will build my church. So it starts with you in your heart and then goes into the church. And then from the church, it begins to influence society around us with moral values, with governmental righteousness, with integrity, with, with, uh, bib with family values, with biblical principles, it begins to affect society for good. We don't take over all of society, but we influence it as much as possible. God's not holding us back. He would love to influence for us to influence society as much as possible with as much possible dominion in this time period as we can, but it won't be 100%. And then, right, and then the next stage is when Yeshua comes back. And then he sets up his kingdom upon this earth for a thousand years. And then the, that's when the kingdom of this world become his kingdom. And then there's another stage after that, the new creation when heaven and earth are joined. But it goes from our hearts into the community of faith and then influencing society around us until Yeshua comes back and sets up his kingdom. Isn't that nice? Wasn't that well put? Very good, Ron. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hallelujah. I like that. So anyway, so we're in a process of coming to fulfill the kingdom and to understand the kingdom. There may be a little surprise to you. Even Yeshua and his disciples in the new covenant, we watch them going through a process of their own understanding of the kingdom. I believe this, that even Yeshua went through a process of understanding the kingdom because he limited himself in the times of the gospel. He limited himself, and then when he was raised from the dead, he changed. I'll give you an example. In Matthew 10, he told his disciples to share the gospel only with Israel, only with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right after he was raised from the dead, he said, go out and share the gospel with all the nations of the world. That was a change of paradigm it was change in the kingdom of God being developed. Are you listening to me? Yes. In Matthew 24, Yeshua says, no one knows the time of the end. Not you and not even I do not know when it is. And then right after the resurrection, he said in Acts 1, now you don't know what the times are. <laughs> so obviously then he knew. So there was a transition for him. Wasn't that interesting? I thought it was too. Thank you very much. But then in, uh, and you'll notice in Acts chapter 1, it, the disciples, Peter and the disciples say to Yeshua, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That was right before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Then right after the Holy, outpouring of the Holy Spirit in chapter 3, he says, are you going to bring about the restoration of all things? So just in a few weeks, Peter and the disciples went from thinking about just the restoration of the kingdom to Israel to the restoration of all things. What was the difference? Just a little thing, which was the baptism and indwelling of the Holy Spirit in power. Well, that made a big difference in their worldview. So the disciples were changing and moving along. Are you with me? There was another significant change in the New Covenant, which you might not be that aware of, but I want you to be more sensitive to, and that was a transition from, from Peter as the leader to Paul as the leader. Paul had a different viewpoint of the kingdom of God. It started with Peter, not with Paul. He was preaching primarily within an Israelite context, and then in chapter 10 and 11, he received the revelation that Gentiles could be saved. 
So it was not Paul who had the revelation that Gentiles could get saved. That was Peter. But what Peter saw was they would get saved and just join in with us. But Paul said, wait a minute. If they're going to be saved and Jesus has sent us out to all the nations of the world, there's something else that's going to happen. There's going to develop a whole other body, an international body, the ecclesia of every tribe, every nation of the world. It's going to become the bride of, of Christ. It's going to be, display the glory of God. And he, and he understood the development, the next 2,000 years of the development of the international church that Peter did not know. Paul took what he had and went on. In fact, Peter was a little stunned by what Paul had to go, but they had to, he had to submit and let the kingdom move on to the next stage. Not just that the Gentiles could get saved and join into Israel, but that God was going to develop a whole international body called the Ecclesia or the church. Amen. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, that's a beautiful thing. In fact, God invested more or less... 2,000 years, a little less, in developing the nation of Israel from Abraham to Yeshua or to the destruction of the temple. And then about 2,000 years of developing the international church, sort of equal amount of time that was into that. And the two are being brought into one today. That's what's happening in the world today. But so we went from an Israel paradigm to an international church paradigm, and now we're moving into them coming together for the kingdom of God, and that's why you're here. Yes. Hallelujah. What a wonderful yes. thing uh, for that to happen. We said what the kingdom of God was, but how does it come to, come to pass? When Israel and the church are joined together, that brings about the kingdom of God. Amen. The church is not going to bring about the kingdom without Israel, and Israel is not going to bring about the kingdom without the church. Are you listening? Amen. But it's when the Israel and the church come in together into cooperation, into a covenantal marriage, then that will release the kingdom of God upon the earth. Amen. That's why it's so significant. That's why some of you can feel just being here in the land, the, the heaviness of, what, of the revelation that's upon you right now and the wisdom and the understanding of the kingdom. That's because God is, is wants to bring that upon you and release that to you. Yeah. Now, I'm thinking that uh, there is something for us Messianic believers, Jews, to, un to embrace much more of the international church. I have to admit this is something that I, I wrestle with over the years because I w having been brought up in a synagogue and a, lar a large part of my family killed in the Holocaust and all that kind of thing, it's, it's hard for me to embrace uh, a, a positive concept of the church. But Jesus said... He said that, that we are to love our wives as he loved the church. Amen. I don't have a problem with that. I have the problem the other way. If that's true, then it's also true the other way. He says to me, do you love my church as much as you love my wife, as you love your wife? Ooh. Wait a minute. I love my wife. I adore my wife. But I think about, wait a minute. But as much as I love her, I have to love this body of people called the International Church, which you are part of. I need to love you as much as I love her. What an amazing challenge. There's kind of like this, little, uh, uh, this little triangle of Jesus, my wife, and the church from my viewpoint. And I'm going to say, wait a minute, I have to, this people, I have to love them as much as they come along with it. You know, I got, my wife comes together with Jesus, and Jesus comes together with you, and we all have to love one another. This is a beautiful thing. There is something beautiful about the international ecclesia that we have not yet seen. Maybe it's just coming into it. Maybe the international church is just like a young woman just starting to come into, into her age of beauty that before that you didn't quite see it. That maybe, maybe now, but there is something for us to see in the world today. And you, When you see believers all over the world then you begin to see that in every part of the body of believers, there are different gifts that other parts of the world do not have. I mean, you want to talk about intercession, talk to the Koreans. You want to talk about fellowship, talk to the Brazilians. I mean, you, 
You don't want to have fellowship like the Koreans and, and intercede like the Brazilians. You want to have fellowship like the Brazilians and intercede like the Koreans. But anyway, you see this in every place around the world. Each body has different, different giftings, one of worship, one of fellowship, one of event, one of power. One of, it's amazing when you see all the giftings and when you put them all together, there's a beautiful thing called the International Ecclesia that Yeshua loves. And Yeshua up in heaven and God looks down and there are these people. 24 hours a day as the earth turns are, are worshiping him 24 hours a day do you know why the earth turns it's so people can worship God in every hour of the day it just turns around people go to sleep somebody else starts to worship and it just comes around he has 27 24 7 worship it's beautiful to him he loves it he adores that it, it's a romance it's a passion with him like I have passion for my wife and I need to begin to see that same beauty. We need to each see that in every nation of the world coming together in this incredible uh, uh, um, mosaic um, 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 tapestry of, of, of a rainbow of beauty that we want to see coming out of it. Now, as we develop, uh, I would also say there's been a development within the land of Israel. Uh, the most influential rabbi in history that I know of, uh, that I'm aware of, my opinion is that it's a rabbi named Rabbi Kook. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He was the chief rabbi at the founding of the nation of Israel. And there were two things that he said that I particularly uh, enjoy that he made famous. I don't know whether he started them or not. But the one thing he said was, uh, and he said that what happened was that you have to look at the nation of Israel not as re redemption as it is. He said, that's not the kingdom of God. But it's the beginning stages of what will become the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? There's a rabbi that does not believe in Yeshua. But he, but, but it's, it, he said and what he, there was a big problem. Because when the state of Israel was formed, it was formed by basically a lot of atheist, communist uh, Jews coming out of uh, Central and Eastern Europe and, and who, and who set, up the, set up this nation and it was ungodly. So you had the, you had the, the, the ultra-Orthodox Jews mostly in Eastern Europe staying there watching these, these socialist atheist Jews from Western Europe coming up and founding the nation of Israel and to them it was a blasphemy. It was not just that they were not for Zionism. It was blasphemous. This was the worst thing they could have imagined happen. And it, today it affects the government of Israel today. It affects our budget today. It affects our taxes. And the taxes is going to go to uh, part to the ultra-Orthodox who don't even believe in this nation. It's a very weird situation. don't want to serve in the army. But anyway, he was an ultra-Orthodox Jew. But he looked and he saw and he said, um, the Jews coming back to Israel, setting up the nation of Israel, and he, he came to the this cannot not be of God. And he said, well, how can that be? These people are all atheists. How, and, how did, and he came up with, with these two concepts. One is, and the second one he, he, it was Ichud uh, HaFachim, which means the unifying of the opposites. And what he meant was, or, or the unifying of the contradictions, he said, did you see the religious community that's against the state of Israel and the state of Israel, which seems to be against God and religion, he said they seem to be two totally opposites. But he said they can't, they can't, they can't not be of God, so there's going to have to be at some point a reconciling of these two things that seem to be opposite. Now, why do I bring that up? Because I think that's what's going to happen with Israel and the church. And these two things that look historically to be opposite, to be impossible, I believe that God is moving them together into unifying the opposites. And also that, that other concept, Tchilat de Gula, this is the beginning stages. We are not saying, none of us Messianic Jews are saying that the government of Israel is the kingdom of God. That's not what we're saying. But we're saying God bringing our nation back and setting up the nation again is moving us toward that stage for it's the beginning of the end times for Yeshua to come back and set up his kingdom upon the earth. It's the beginning of the process. So what's happening in Israel is a process to bring this to pass and that there will be ultimately a reconciling of two things that seem to be opposite, which will be Israel and the church. And so as you come to the development of this revelation, the reconciling of the opposites, and then Israel will come in and what is just the beginning 
of the development of the end times, this will all come together in the end to see the kingdom of God upon the earth. Now, just to help you with this, one more thing, and then we'll pray. I'm past time already. Give me two, give me two more minutes here. That um, uh, There has also been a development in Islam over the past uh, 50, 60 years. Uh, Islam was always there, but it seemed to be that at the end of World War II, when this nation was founded, that among the Muslim world, since this land was supposed to be Muslim occupied, the freeing of this land from, from Muslim hands was, was a blasphemy in their eyes. And at that time, there seemed to be, for the first time, a, a coming into the, the, the thought of radical Islam, a, a transition from the, from the plan of the, of the Nazis to kill, to kill all the Jews. And there was a radicalization, a, a hatred of Israel, and an idea that you could begin to kill, that we want to kill everyone in this nation. That began to develop, and then when, is, when Jerusalem was captured in 67 and 73, then there developed this idea of more of terrorism, which was made popular. And then in 1979 was the first time that a, an Islamic extremist group took over a country, which was... Anybody know what country? Iran. The Ayatollahs in every other nation of the world, they were Arabs and there were, and there were sheikhs and, and Islamic radicals in the nation, but they were not over the nation. Iran was the first time that, uh, that, the, uh, that radical Islamic groups took over the government of the nation. And because of that, all of a sudden they had power in the taxes, in the oil prices, and, and they began to use that power to fund... Um, terrorism around the world and Shiite extremism, which is why I pray and I think we should all pray that the United States and nations of the world do not remove the sanctions from them because it's one thing that's just a little bit breaking them right now. But then the radical Islamic movements begin to multiply around the world. Al-Qaeda, which is a Sunni group, and then all of them, maybe it's 20, 30 different Islamic radical groups around the world. But what's happened recently there's been a new group which is a whole nother leap in Islamic concept, which is what was called ISIS. Because what they're saying is Islamic State. They're saying now that not just, not just Iran, they're saying they, they want to have this group actually take over the nations of the world in the Middle East. This is a total change of thought. This is not where, I mean, it's where Al-Qaeda and these other groups wanted to be. But they never declared themselves to be the Khalifat. They never declared themselves that they were actually going to take over the world and declare an Islamic state over the whole world. Wow. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, it was called ISIS, which, me which meant just in Iraq and Syria, but they removed that. And now they're saying, we are going to take over the whole world. It's an exact demonic mirror, per bizarre, perverted opposite of Revelation eleven fifteen. 15. Now that's the evil. I, I can't think of anything more evil in the world today. And if you think eventually if that gets hold of an economic system in the United Nations and you put that all together and you're go we're going to see evil in this world that has never been before. But what I want to say here, and this is the last point, is that we are the opposite of that. They are the perversion. They're not the originators of this. We have the kingdom of God. We have a kingdom of God in love, in sacrifice, in peace. And we want to bring peace to the world through the gospel. We want to bring eternal life and not death. We want to bring love into the nations of the world. But we also intend to take over the world, not them. We are going to replace them. We are not going to have it. And you need to understand that your end goal is not to evacuate this planet, not to leave this place, not to give up and turn this place over to ISIS and to, and to, uh, and to the Shiites and the Sunnis and the UN and the devil and the, and the forces of darkness. That's not God's plan. And if you still think that in you, I want to drive that lies out of you. And I want to tell you that the kingdom of God is for uh, that all the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord. He's coming back. There will be peace on earth. There will be unity among the nations. There will be kingdom of God from Jerusalem as its capital. There will be prosperity on the earth. There will be a beautiful vision that will come to pass for the whole earth. And we are for it and we have a plan. That's why we were asking in that little video that you just saw when we asked her, so what, was our, what do we want to do as a team? 
Well, we want to preach the gospel to Israel. Yes. Do we want to unify the church? Yes. But really what we want to do is to bring about the kingdom of Yeshua on this planet. Let's not compromise. Let's not compromise. Let's not be cowards. And let's believe that the kingdom of God will come. I'm looking for you to be partners with us. Not to donate to Revive Israel. You can do that too. But I'm looking for you to be partners with us to establish the kingdom of Yeshua on this planet, to bring him back to God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that the kingdoms of this world would be taken over. Let's not settle with an evacuation plan. Amen. 